very much. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here and a delight to be invited to such an interesting undertaking and a challenging one too. Uh, I work very closely at UNC with my colleagues at Duke. We're eight miles away and so even that is a kind of transactional issue that has to be navigated. Uh, you have some larger issues uh, to deal with in integrating people across the various urban centers uh, in this project and it's a fascinating undertaking. Uh, very excited by it. I want to thank the organizers. As I said to them privately, it's been absolutely seamless to this point. We will assess at the end, uh, as they ask you to, but at this point, absolutely seamless in uh, bringing it all together. Uh, and I'm, I'm delighted to be here. I should also say, uh, Alan Scott sits here, one of my long-term colleagues, and Alan will be wondering why on earth I'm here speaking about the urban. I haven't ever written anything in an urban geography journal, uh, or in, uh, or really, anything on the city as such. So maybe I should begin there. Uh, as a geographer, of course, this is precisely the issue. For me, there was always a paradox in the urban. In 2009, we learned that uh, from the United Nations uh, population data that uh, over half the world's population are now living in cities. But in 2012, we learned from OTAD uh, that 75 to 80 percent of all trade in intermediate goods and services now flow through global value chains dominated by lead firms in the major urban areas of the north and increasingly of East Asia. So the city, on the one hand, is the dynamic, as Ed Soldier continually reminds me, is the dynamic of the economy, the primary dynamic. It's also, and for me as a geographer, a primary beneficiary of a global system of relationships. Uh, and so for me, the city uh, has a larger perspective, uh, and that is uh, the ways in which it is related to and shapes the broader geographies with which I'm concerned, which largely have been often quite marginal, rural, um, and um, peripheral economies, whether it be post-socialist Eastern Europe, increasingly China, um, or my own region of Northern England. Um, and so this paradox drives me to ask, how do we understand space, and how do we understand it in thoroughly relational terms? So this begin, brings me directly, I think, to the question of urban humanities and to the responsibility, I think, of the humanities in the face of this transformation that we now know to be global, but also urban. And this is the role of critical cartography, uh, where some interesting, I think, working knowledge models may have emerged. I hope so, I'm not sure, but I hope so, uh, and maybe I can try to focus a little bit on some of those. The working models are also about bringing constituencies together. And I thought I'd begin with a comment and then turn to my slides about how I think in critical cartography certain kinds of constituencies have emerged. Um, Jonathan's already referred to the marginal nature of our work in our disciplines. I would call it more minoritarian discourses at the very heart of the discipline. Because in geography, it's very much about unpacking the meaning of space, region, place that people like Michael, Alan, myself, and others have been engaged with for many years. Uh, so it's a minoritarian discourse, which is critical of the ways in which a certain kind of understanding has emerged. But it's a minoritarian discourse that, for me, in critical cartography, was stimulated by something else. And it was, over the last 10 years, it was the return, probably, of people like you to the academy. That is, and we would, I would guess 30 to 40 percent of my graduate students over the last 10 years have come out of some social movement or other, some environmental movement, some urban political organization, and they have come back to the academy insisting that they be given and learned tools that we used to call techniques, uh, and we used to have a certain suspicion about them at times, uh, but to learn tools that they can use to mobilize a certain kind of urban environmental and social practice. And this has really invigorated, I think, um, the ways in which we think, because these are people working with migrant organizations, precarious wage work and unwaged work, um, human rights organizations, uh, and they come asking for certain kinds, and not just of tools, but a different way of thinking about knowledge production. They also come with some amazing organizational skills. I've learned all sorts of hand signals that I didn't used to know about for controlling the flow of discussion in meetings, because that's the kind of technologies that the movements have created. And they've come 
particularly with some kind of articulation of a deep understanding of theory, somewhere between Marx, Foucault, Deleuze in particular. So that's where I begin. Preparing, I had a paper, and that's on migration, borders, and critical cartographies, and Michael was very kind to respond and said, yes, but what, are, what kind of issues are you engaging with? And I think he came with three questions. We build on Jonathan's challenge and the organizer's challenge to pose some questions for us. But how did this new field, new cartography, we'll call it NC since I'm from North Carolina, uh, or Michael called it that, how did NC emerge and what, what does it consist? How is the best NC work structured and produced? What's my experience of that? I've already referred a little bit to the role of organizations in mobilizing a complete, I think, a major change in the production of knowledge in the university and demanding more of it. Um, and the question of the relationship among the disciplines. So I've tried to say something about each, and this is going to finish exactly at 10. I was given 30 minutes, and I will try to hold to that. Of course, I have a 50 minute presentation. So I may just end uh, uh, at 10 o'clock, it won't matter. Um, let me define some terms. State cartography. Dennis Wood has argued uh, that at the, the bottom, cartography is dead. Long live mapping. Uh, and there he makes the claim that uh, the traditional cartographic perspectives emerged so strongly within the apparatus of the state and later uh, the interests of capital that the emergence of large-scale topographic systems, first of all, demand the state uh, because of the cost in developing such incredible um, topographic mapping, such as the National Cadastre. Um, uh, but they became so embroiled in the nature of state apparatuses uh, that, in a sense, they um, have a limit for their use. They tend to be part of what Tessato calls a kind of strategical control and management of space. Um, secondly, partly because of that, the academy, the professional cartographer, also uh, associated cartography very much with a representational practice. Luckily, we're with architects, I don't need to say very much about what that means. Uh, but that direct representationalism and the kind of epistemology uh, of a one-to-one -one correspondence theory of truth um, has, all, has been right at the heart of the techniques of traditional cartography. So let's just call that state cartography. Critical cartography emerges in the wake of that in trying to think through some of its limits. And there are a variety of ways. I think Michael was very helpful in saying, why are all these terms emerging? So the terms that I would work with and uh, variously respond to in the, in the current uh, journals would be people's cartography, community mapping, public participation cartography, and geographic information systems, art mapping, <laughs> radical cartography, or sometimes called social movement mapping. And then I'm going to say something about new cartography. So what I want to do is move fairly quickly through an example or two of each of these, and hopefully this will lead us to think a little bit more. Now, in terms of the Digital Humanities Project, this is not something I'm particularly knowledgeable about, but I do have some local examples. At UNC, we have the um, Ancient World Mapping Center. Uh, it's a very interesting project. It's been going for over 15 years. Uh, it's run by a group of very dedicated historians, archaeologists, and it's focused in particular on the classical world and the Mediterranean. Uh, and they produced a series of wonderful atlases uh, of the ancient world. And the type of work they produce is very much in keeping with, I would say, a kind of traditional cartography. It begins with the, essentially this traditional map, and it locates on it the urban centers of Rome, the particular period, or the layout of a particular city in the so this for me is not, class, it's very interesting. It's very, I think, she transformative in the context of some of the historical discussions of the region. And in some of the maps, they've even now begun to redo the sea level changes from the particular period to map out the coastline of particular periods in history. I can see the value of that, but that's not what I mean by critical cartography. The Duke, I'm involved with another group, which is called Border Works Laboratory, uh, the Franklin uh, Humanities Center. And there, uh, this is a dif slightly different shift in the ways in which the humanities um, are engaging with mapping at Duke University. 
and in the region, a group very much like yours. Uh, and there they have been working on this defining the line. I'll come back to that question of the line in a minute. Now, in which then, thinking about the role of cartography as a tool, practice, and discourse, along with a set of institutions, which frames then a certain kind of imperial project, or a national project. And so uh, one of the things that's particularly important there is how we understand the role of the map as a kind of performance of the state. If we understand the state as always being performed, and its territorial structure as being produced through certain institutions and practices, rather than just existing on the land, then what we have to understand is the, way, the ways in which the visual iconography, mapping and other practices such as Leo Belgicus here on the left, or Bohemia in the middle, uh, we use at various periods to shape a certain notion of the association between institutions, identity, and territory. That's not a natural association. It's produced historically at a particular period, and it results in enormous contestation. There is Pitt and Bonaparte struggling over their world map to struggle to define the territorial order of a particular um, uh, agreement in that period. And on the far side is Roosevelt framed from a very interesting map we found at the uh, Library of Congress. Roosevelt framed as the figure of the United States. And the face, if you turn that sideways, I hope you can see his head. The association between identity, political figure, and national territorial map is essential in performing the state. This takes us, I think, somewhere towards what we mean by critical cartography. Uh, one of the challenges for traditional cartography is this representational logic of mapping. Here is the bird's eye view on the left, and it's been that plan bastard as the archetype of a kind of representational map. I don't think it is that. I think there's a lot more going on, and some scholars have worked well, I think, to unpack the ways in which that map operated as a kind of social practice and what the politics of that work. And on the right is uh, the Gear Architects group in LA uh, mapping out, using the bird's eye view, the um, space given over to parking along the uh, Figueroa corridor in LA. I think this also takes traditional approaches to mapping, the bird's eye view, the god trick, as it's been called, and, and turns it into a kind of critical investigation. That's the end of my digital humanities until I get to the very end. Let me now go back to my mapping. What marks this shift in critical cartography? I would say a couple of things. One is Gunnar Olsen's fascinating engagement. He says, Immanuel Kant failed. As a geographer of 32 years of instruction in geography, he produces three critiques. Where was the fourth critique? The fourth critique, he said, was the cartographic Kant should have written. That is to invigorate the spatial imagination through the question of the line. What, Gunnar says, is geography if it is not the drawing and interpreting of a line? To draw a line, to mark a distinction, to create a difference. This is the geographical imagination and the cartographic critique. In other terms, Dennis Wood and uh, John Krieger have suggested that the map is always propositional. Never more than that, always making a proposition. And in my own work, I like to use the, the phrase, the social lives of maps. Maps operate as discourses, in institutions, as practices. And in doing so, they are the ways in which, one of the ways, that space is produced. So we have this notion of cartography, which is traditional, and I here characterize it in three ways. Cartographic representation, the gaze, the god trick. Terms I think this community knows well and re reads and writes against. Uh, and with. The impression of space then, in this notion of cartography, is that space is a kind of surface. A, a kind of surface which has a kind of completed horizontality. And there is the problem. That moment is the problem. 
It is the basis for geographical analysis in many, many parts of my field, and an exciting part of that research work. But what it does is produce a certain notion of space as fixed, inert, dead. What was it Foucault said? Did it begin with Bergson? That space was thought of as the fixed, the dead, the inert. It begins precisely because we think of space as stitched up and we represent it as stitched up space. The classic is an LA example. I tried to find some LA examples. It's the Van Sant map, wonderful cartographer, who's created uh, using um, satellite imagery of the globe, has created the Van Sant map at the bottom by removing digitally all of the cloud cover on the globe to produce what he claims is the more, more and most accurate map of the globe. So you strip off the clouds and you have an accurate map. That's the problem, right? That's a kind of representational logic that we have to work against. And so I want to turn with, quickly, to Doreen Massey. Um, uh, Alan reminded me we were all from the north of England and Doreen comes very close from the two of us too. And very committed northerner and hence very sensitive to regional production and to the role of space. For Doreen, we have to think differently than this surface and stitched up model of space. Space for her is produced through practices always. These are, in a sense, canned uh, comments from a very expansive and interesting book. Practices produce space. Space is always thoroughly, and that's the key word here, not just relational, but thoroughly relational. Uh, and, and it's always about space-time, not space or time. It is, it exists, and it's production as a sphere of what she calls coexisting multiplicities. Your practices, space-time, of coexisting multiplicities, creating and um, embedded in a series of heterogeneous practices and processes. And it's the heterogeneity of practices and processes, largely that we mean by the city, actually, I think, a sphere of dynamic simultaneity. It's dynamic, but it's also simultaneous, or what she calls wonderfully the mixity of co-evil trajectories. So if we take if I take nothing away from what critical cartography tries to do, it's that bottom phrase, the mixity of co-evil trajectories. How to understand practice, not as creating forms of stitched up space, although it might, under strategic powers, particularly of certain kinds of state practice, but how to understand space as always multiple trajectories of co, co, of co evil coexistence in their mixity? This is what Deleuze and Gregory call the new cartography. So, very quickly to, to argue or to summarize, in a sense, traditional cartography is a tracing. A map is never a tracing. It can be, but if it is, it's a kind of representational tool. What distinguishes the map from the tracing is that it is entirely oriented towards what he calls, or they call, experimentation in contact <coughs> with the real. The map does not reproduce an unconscious closed in upon itself. It constructs the unconscious. The map is open and connectable in all of its dimensions. It is detachable, reversible, susceptible to constant multiplication. It can be torn, reversed, adapted to any kind of mountain. Reworked by an individual group or social formation, it can be drawn on a wall, conceived of as a work of art, constructed as a political action or as a meditation. A map has multiple entryways as opposed to tracings, which always come back to the same. The map has to do with performance, whereas the tracing always implies an alleged competence, a technique, an accuracy, a fixity. So within the space of what I would call critical cartography, the variety of uh, initiatives, I think, that have emerged, which have been driven directly by this impulse or influenced indirectly by it. The classic form in geography is Bill Bunby's Detroit Expedition, in which Bill takes the techniques of the traditional cartographer to a community and asks, what are your questions? What are your needs? And so we get that a kind of people's cartography driven by questions that people are asking and the skill of the geographer, in this case, to try to answer them. He had done many, many maps um, from the 1960s onwards, and here is one on the money transfer in the rental market in metropolitan 
Detroit, from what he called the city of uh, death, the city of slums here, to a city of affluence and a city of superfluity, tracing out the relationality of the city between poverty and wealth and how that is driven by rent differential. We see this in indigenous mapping, it's very common, I've just chosen the classic and simplest of these, in many uh, very interesting indigenous mapping initiatives, um, often linked to um, uh, classics and other, and Latin American research in particular, uh, we see efforts to, in a sense, destabilize the traditional. And the simple way here is the inversion of the standard uh, northern privileged map uh, by shifting it around and giving priority to the south. We see, in, uh, again, back at the, the Border Works group, efforts by students to try to mobilize this impulse to create new kinds of maps for a new kind of urban living. Everybody on the West Coast knows what these are. Bicycle maps of the city to enable cyclists to operate more effectively in an urban environment in which there has been some general historical hostility. Um, the Atlas of Cyberspace, created by uh, particularly Martin Dodge in Britain, in which the question there is, uh, we map so many things which are fixed, objective, uh, solid, what happens and what drives those kinds of relationships? And so the question here is, how does information flow? How does it move? And here in the Atlas of Cyberspace, there are hundreds and hundreds of examples of maps. They've mapped in various ways, user net, uh, in, um, uh, IP address exchange, uh, email exchange. They've shown, I think quite nicely, the globalism of urban life through the ways in which information is shifted. They've also shown how the global information age is thoroughly regional, controlled, regulated in very specific kinds of spaces. So I think this is a kind of destabilizing of traditional cartography in very interesting ways. And the map at the bottom left is just an incredible map of, of, of um, the geography of internet address space in Britain about 10 years ago. And it's showing, of course, the dominance of finance capital in the city. I'll move fairly quickly through a series of examples in art geography where this impulse, particularly a Deleuzian moment, actually a Foucauldian and Deleuzian moment, um, comes together uh, in a series of artists that I work with. This is Ellen, uh, Ellen Slavic. I've got her name off there. Ellen Slavic, who's uh, written this wonderful book on her own art on bombing cities. And um, here she has on the right, Baghdad, uh, World Cities, uh, and the book on the left. Uh, and uh, her work is really to try to use traditional map to destabilize the role of the state map by linking it to the destruction. On the one hand, stitched up space of the state penetrated materially, physically, violently by the bombing practices. Here, Pedro, Duke. Uh, Pedro gives these maps folded up to Latino um, uh, migrants, people without papers, people who move the border, cross the border on a regular basis. Uh, he asks them to carry them in their back pocket uh, as they travel the border. And these are people that might travel until about three years ago, travel that border once, two, three, four times a year. Uh, and some are people who have passport uh, and rights some rights, others are not. And then the map comes back carrying the physical impress of the, trans of the, of the trajectory of the movement. Sometimes with watermarks, sometimes uh, with soil marks, sometimes very clean and, and not. Uh, but to try to show how the question of the border is first of all an American question, and secondly, how it is composed of so many multiple and different trajectories. Here is uh, Rodney Place, a three cities triptych, uh, in which he's taken Cape Town, Johannesburg, and Durban, and relocated them out of any kind of traditional cartographic practice to try to show again, I think, various ways in which using his art, the relationality of space determines the kinds of um, conditions in each of those cities. Uh, these are available, so we can look at them later uh, if you need to. 
one of my good friends, Kanarinka, she now moved from Raleigh to uh, Boston to form the Institute for Infinitely Small Things, uh, very much influenced by the news again. And here she's created a map with community people in Boston, which is the renaming of Boston. You pay 10 cents, and you get to choose the name for any street, any uh, location in the city. And th that location then is mapped by her, and the map is then produced and sold with the money that you've given, um, and copies made, and distributed on the street as the new map of Boston. Very much a kind of psychogeographic practice. Yes, you take the map of Paris and you go to Berlin, and you use the map of Paris to walk around Berlin as a way of deconstructing this representation. Here's Mark Bradford, I don't know if anybody knows him here, he's from Southern California, and he uses um, the maps of LA and the region, picking up garbage, detritus, paper, cups, and using those then as material on the map to represent in various ways and produce a very different kind of understanding uh, of the city. Um, Christian Nold has done some very interesting work on psychogeography, and particularly in um, San Francisco. Uh, and this is his emotional map of San Francisco down by Mission District uh, and on the streets. And here is the content. It's essentially a diary, a spatial diary of his experiences and practices in the city uh, across a period of time. Uh, but it then pr produces spaces of intensity, spaces of engagement and interaction. And then there's a whole series of radical geographers from the movements. This is the Atlas of Radical Geography. Uh, it contains 12 fantastic essays, along with some of the most innovative um, map productions that we might uh, have seen. Um, they include uh, things like the geography of uh, Eurasia. This is the struggle over Barcelona in Barcelona, in which the 1992 Olympics generated a real threat to the neighborhood of the fishermen, and the movements organized with the community to produce maps of Eurasia in order to mobilize a certain kind of practice. So on the one hand, it's a map of impending destruction. On the other hand, it's the mobilizing tool for a reaction to that, Again, essentially a kind of 1992 flashback, flash crowd, uh, I would say. On the border of Eastern Europe, people are using these mapping technologies to show travelers how to get across the border safely by mapping out the paths safe and non-surveilled travel. And in um, Strasbourg, there's a group, Pure Pure d'Etude, that have done a wonderful uh, series of maps looking at this spatial interaction uh, amongst key actors. This is not very clear. They've done one on the police, one on the banks. They've done about 12 or 15 of these maps. They're essentially engineers, and they bring together a different kind of conception of institutional linkage which produces then a very different understanding of the spatial um, domain uh, of power. And I think this is important for our discussions because here one of the constituencies of engineers, they are the best. They think in terms of computer diagrams, in, in terms of electrical circuits, and they're able as a result to produce relational maps uh, of some power. This is an inverted map of North Africa and the European Union from Hakitektura, Again, engineers by training, uh, computer engineers. And what they've said is, let's not think of the European border as a fortress, a line, a boundary, but think of it as a set of intensities in which those intensities are forms of relationship, geographical, spatial practices that always cross the border. Communication devices, aerial satellite imaging, uh, ships moving, uh, people telephoning each other, the mail system, shipping uh, letters, and other kinds of goods. And how then does that refigure what we understand by Europe, the border, the edge? Um, there are more, including our own counter cartographies. But I'll finish now with my quick summary, with the wrap up, thank you. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, which is the new cartography and the challenge for the humanities, if there is a challenge. Because it seems to me that, the, that this new spatial imaginary that comes with new cartography comes, in a sense, with not just a new epistemology, a new practice, and new constituencies 
uh, potentially new institutional forms, but it is, in a sense, it comes with a responsibility. A responsibility to deal with a global world that is so thoroughly relational. So Doreen Nassi, uh, to return to her work again, she argues that spaces are contemporaneous coexistence of becoming and becoming. And it is the glorious mixity of coevil and multiple trajectories in their thrown togetherness. This is a wonderful sentence, it takes a while to, to catch it. But it's the thrown togetherness, the relationality of space, which seems to me to pose a fundamental challenge. It is Derrida's challenge of friendship. What is the responsibility when we live in urban environments, in academic institutions linked to the state in a world which is so thoroughly global. 80% of intermediate trade and services run through value chains that are controlled by lead funds whose benefit flows to the city. So the responsibility to those at the distance and the ethics of responsibility, it is the post-colonial question. It is the geographical question of relationality. It's the question of the other. And it seems to me that is always and always has been the question for urban studies and where the humanities has always been able to enter. The question of ethics and how we understand the question of ethics, in this case, at a distance. Thank you.